Today's episode is about a self-taught mathematician, astronomer, compiler of almanacs, a writer, an inventor, and the man who may have completed the design for Washington, D.C., capital city of the United States of America, from memory. Benjamin Banneker was born November 9th, 1731, on a farm near Baltimore that he would eventually inherit from his father. Although he occasionally attended a one-room Quaker schoolhouse, Banneker was mostly self-educated and did much of his learning through the avid reading of borrowed books. It was noted that from a young age he was particularly skilled at math. His early accomplishments included constructing an irrigation system for the family farm and a wooden clock that kept accurate time and ran for more than 50 years until his death. Okay, so I'm just going to pause there. The man who didn't go to school made a clock. A clock, people. He made a damn clock. In what was likely his 20s. Huh? He didn't go on a clock-making class using a voucher he found on Groupon. He didn't stay up all night watching YouTube clock-making tutorials. He didn't even attempt to get a degree in horology. Legend has it that one day, he borrowed a watch, took it apart, and thought, yeah, I'll make one of those, but better. Now, one of the dangers of doing any kind of historical research is falling down what is known as a rabbit hole. You know how when you need to study for a test, but somehow you find yourself still awake at 2am the day of the test, googling some trivial facts like, what happened to Big Daddy Kane's brother, Little Daddy Shane? By the way, I don't know people, and if any of you do know what happened to Little Daddy Shane, please email me so I can get some damn sleep. Well, this casual clock making thing sent me down such a hole. And so I tried to see how easy it is to make a clock. And let me tell you right now, it ain't easy people. Making a clock is not easy. I'm not going to put you through the whole 10 hour torture session I went through. But I will share with you this one line from feltmagnet.com. A wonderful little arts and crafts website I found in between eating Doritos. And staring in horror at the search results produced when a sleepy dyslexic misspells clock making i'll attach a link to the site somewhere in the notes but this one sentence illustrates how difficult it must have been for young benjamin to have casually made a clock here we go because of the precision required in cutting and sanding the teeth of the gears escapement wheel and other parts making even a simple wooden clock demands access to power tools and a workshop. I'll stop right there. But for anyone willing to jump down the clockmaking rabbit hole with me, please stick around till the end of the episode as I have a little treat for you. When Banneker's father passed away, he took over the running of the family farm, cultivating a business selling tobacco and began to teach himself astronomy accurately forecasting lunar and solar eclipses in 1789. In 1791, because clockmaking, running a farm and astronomy were not enough to occupy his mind, he turned his attention to civil rights and wrote an open letter to Thomas Jefferson to try and convince him that slavery was absurd and to see black people as more than just slaves. I've attached links in the notes so you can read the full letter. Jefferson was so impressed with Banneker's letter and the almanac he sent along with it that he recommended Banneker to be part of the surveying team that mapped out Washington, D.C. Side note, he weren't impressed enough to give up having slaves, though. According to legend, midway through the designing of Washington, D.C., the lead architect quit the team, taking all of his plans with him leaving Benjamin to rescue the venture by recreating all of the plans for the city from memory. 
ensuring that the capital was constructed on time and as planned. Despite all his amazing accomplishments, Benjamin Banneker is actually most known for his almanacs. Now, when I read that, like most of you, I wondered, uh, what the hell is an almanac? Well, an almanac is a book or table containing the calendar of the days, weeks and months of the year. A record of various astronomical phenomena, and often they come with climate information and seasonal suggestions for farmers. Using one, a farmer was able to estimate the proper time to begin seasonal farm work. They'd also often contain interesting facts, proverbs, medical advice, remedies, and even jokes. So, it was a bit like all the magazines you find in a doctor's surgery rolled into one handy publication. Possession of a good almanac could be the difference between a farmer having a good crop and no crop. And Benjamin Banneker's were the best. Between 1792 and 1797, he published six in total, each one receiving much acclaim for both accuracy and entertainment value. Benjamin Banneker passed away in his sleep on October the 9th, 1806, on his 75th birthday, and was buried on October the 11th. Now, I'd love to end this story right there. However, an interesting thing happened during his funeral. While being laid to rest, the home of this genius inventor, writer, astronomer and civil rights campaigner who designed whole cities from memory and built clocks for fun, mysteriously burned to the ground. Destroying virtually all of his writings, plans, inventions and the now famous clock, meaning that his true genius may never truly be known. I'm not one for conspiracy theories, but that sounds kind of off to me. Well, today we give Benjamin Banneker his flowers and take a moment to say thank you to this self-taught genius. To learn more about Black History, please check out the Black History Buff podcast, YouTube, Twitter, Pinterest, and website. Just Google Black History Buff and you'll find us there. Oh, and if you enjoyed this, please share, because Black History is world history. Oh. You thought I'd forgotten, didn't you? The clock-making rabbit hole thing? Uh, well, no, I didn't. So, here for your listening pleasure is Adrian Iredell's glide to building a wooden clock. Warning, do not listen to this if you are operating heavy machinery, driving, or coming back to work after a heavy lunch break. Enjoy. So you'd like to build a wooden clock, but you're not quite sure whether you're capable of it or not. The most exciting time is when the plans arrive in the mail. They come complete with written instructions, sheets showing the front view and the side view, each part in full size, and a sheet for all the arbors and spaces. This sheet is really useful for when you're putting all the wheels together. I guess you could make the whole thing with a fret saw and sandpaper, but a few tools are really useful, like a band saw and a scroll saw. And a good bench drill that's nice and straight. And also a sanding pad. This last item is really useful, I use it all the time. Of course, a nice bit of bench space is good too. Uncluttered, clean and neat. I like to cut out all the wheels first. Stick the plans to the appropriate piece of board with spray adhesive. Remember, slow and accurate. That's what you need. A 
set of brad point drills are handy for drilling all the holes. Be really careful, take it slowly and drill them absolutely perfectly. I like to cut out the teeth using a bandsaw, but some people prefer to use their scroll saw. My tools are pretty cheap and nasty, so my scroll saw isn't as accurate as it might be able to be. If you've got the money, buy good quality tools. But if you're like me and haven't got the money, you can still make a decent clock with cheap tools. Just take your time. When you cut out the teeth, leave a little on the end. Then mount the wheel on your vertical sander and rotate for a perfect circle. Sanding pads can get clogged quickly, particularly if you're sanding ply. I use a yellow snot bar to clean off my pads and bring them back to almost new. This is the same pad as the dirty one just shown earlier. Cut out all your internal shapes with the scroll saw. To get nice smooth teeth, I've adapted a small metal file onto my scroll saw. The teeth on this wheel are straight cut, but this file attachment is really good for those rounded tooth designs. Once you've done all the cutting out and drilling, remove the paper from the board. A heat gun helps lift the paper. If the plan allows, you can use a router to round off the inside pattern. Unfortunately, I haven't found an, a better way to do the final touches other than with hand sanding. If only there was a tool to do this work. Generally speaking, it's a good idea to keep your wheels unfinished. However, I've used varnish, stains and oils on, on my wheels, so long as you don't get it in the teeth. Keep the teeth clean and unfinished. Ply is structurally excellent for wheels, but you can use wedges of solid wood glued together to make blanks for solid wood wheels. Use this page as your guide to cut out all your spaces and rods and assemble your wheels. Using buffing compound on your polish wheel keeps your rods and spaces nice and shiny. Some clock plans require a number of rods all the same size, so I drill a hole with the appropriate depth into a scrap of timber and use this and then use this as a depth gauge to cut all my rods. Clean them up on the vertical sander.
the arbors and spaces sheet shows you which wheels, pinions and spaces go together. You might think building the frames the easy part, but I find it the most difficult. The holes must be drilled exactly straight and exactly in the right place and spacing. Then ensure that the front and back frames align exactly. Don't rush this next step. This next step is really critical. Insert each wheel set one at a time into the frame to make sure that they run free. Then insert the wheel sets two at a time to make sure they run with each other exactly and have the right amount of space between pinion and gear. You should be able to blow on the wheel and have it turn its matching wheel freely. Don't be scared to innovate on the design plan. I put wide insets on the top and bottom of these hands. You can spray all the bits and pieces and the frame with clear lacquer. But remember, make sure that the holes don't have lacquer in them. This is the wind key for the swoopy clock. You can use whatever design you like for the drive weight. I like to use timber. With a hollow for the lead. Once you've assembled your clock there's always a bit of tinkering, staring, swearing and more tinkering before it finally comes alive. But there's just nothing like that feeling of seeing your clock live. So go out and give it a go. You'll be surprised at what you can achieve. I certainly was.